Good afternoon to the hardy people who are here for the most important and best panel. And, uh, and also to the, we've had out throughout the day, just so you know, uh, a couple of thousand people live streaming as well. So we also want to welcome the uh, virtual audience that is joining us from beyond the camera. Now, throughout this conference, we've heard a lot of different really interesting technologies, cyber rifles, electroceuticals, robots, drones, uh, you name it. And this is the panel where we're actually going to talk about that writ large and what it means for warfare, and what it means for the military. And we're very fortunate to have a terrific panel here with us today. I'm going to introduce them briefly. And then each will give a little bit of an opening comment. Uh, we'll get into some conversation, and we will engage you um, since you are still here. So I'm going to start at the far end. Sorry. Oh, oh uh, right. Sorry. We have a uh, poll for you to take first. Uh, and then because we have to take this poll so we know what to talk about. So if you would please tell us what you think the most important new innovation, because this is the question that the panelists are about to answer. So why don't you tell us what you think? And then, OK, you're running out of time if you haven't answered already. OK. Huh. Reasonably distributed, although directed energy, so noted, comes out on the short end. Robotics, artificial intelligence, genomics, and bioengineering, which I think is pretty consistent with what we've heard throughout the day. So let me introduce the panel, and then we'll see what they think, what their answer is, and how well it compares with your answer. Uh, first, I want to introduce Fran Zenzen, who is a chief operating officer at Assure. And I'm going to tell you, I really want you to look at their bios, but I'm going to tell you what they mean, which is she is an, uh, a really working on R&D between the university and the defense uh, industry. So that's an interesting uh, place to be, um, and she has a great perspective for us. Dr. Lynn Parker is with the National Science Foundation, but what you really need to know about her is that she herself is one of the nation's leading performers of research in artificial intelligence and robotics and other things as well. So she is both a performer and a person who helps other people perform similar research. Alan Easterling is a, oh, has such a multifaceted career, started out as a naval officer and as an acquisition executive, and today is at Northrop Grumman where he is their futurist. So that is a very interesting job and appropriate for this panel. Karen Currington is, has done it all. She's a C-17 pilot. She was a defense appropriator, um, a defense professional in the Department of Defense. And she's now at Facebook. So we have a very interesting perspective there. And I, I end with you, General Goldfein, because I'm going to start with you. So General David Goldfein is Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force. He was director of the Joint Staff before that. Um, and has an amazing career as a warfighter and a leader. Um, and as I told him when we were waiting in the green room, if you like, you can still look up uh, one of the signal experiences of his life. When we say that he's had time between, behind enemy lines, we're not talking about Congress. So Google it, look it up. Um, what I'd like to do to start off, you know, the, the role of innovation in warfare uh, is as old as warfare. I mean, the links between technical innovation and war and society and war and technical innovation, that's been going around and around for thousands of years, you know, certainly at least since the stirrup. So is it different now? It sounds like throughout this day that's certainly been the case that we've all been discussing, that it's global, it's commercial, that the military doesn't necessarily own the means of innovation anymore. And that's the kind of conversation we've been having and that I'd like this panel to have. And where I'd like to start with you, General Goldfein, is, um, you know, General Milley said this morning, um, there's not going to be any innovation in the next 10 years that's going to change the nature of ground warfare, and largely because our acquisition system won't allow us to incorporate it. But after that, it's going to change the nature of ground warfare. So in the next 10 years, or if you agree with General Milley's timeline, What's going to change, what innovation is going to change the nature of, in all of your domains, cyber, um, airspace, what do you see coming down the pike? Yeah, thanks. And it's a great question, and, uh, and, it's, and it's really an honor to be on the panel, with, especially with such a distinguished group. What's going to really change for us, and it, it won't surprise you that when we talk innovation, as airmen, we feel that's central. I mean, we, that, that's how we became a service. Right, when we focus on air and space and cyber and how we pull that together. So for us, as we look to the future, the coin of the realm is about 
multi-domain battlefield network. And what happens, because it was interesting when you took a look at, you know, at, at your question, mm -hmm. I would actually say all of the above. Because it's really not any one particular aspect of robotics or hypersonics or whatever. The, the real question for us is, what happens when you pull that together in a multi-domain environment? And it's central to the way we as an Air Force think. You know, if you take a look, you know, I was privileged to be the last uh, F-117 pilot to fly the stealth fighter. And when I took off and flew in that aircraft, I actually had a switch in the cockpit that when I flipped the switch, all of my sensors stowed and I shut the world off and my radio stopped. And in a single ship, single domain, air domain, sequential, closed system, I went in and do my, did my business. Today's F-35, just to give you an example, before you actually even taxi, you turn the switch and power it up, it starts doing machine-to-machine -machine collaboration in the network. It compares uh, information and it has algorithms that produce confidence values and when it, it reaches a certain value, it actually starts placing symbology on the visor of the pilot. And that same symbology is displayed in command and control networks and so it's a complete open system architecture and a networked approach. And so when you talk machine-to-machine -machine collaboration, big data, and human machine teaming to make better decisions, that's what the future looks like for us. And so I would tell you for, as an, from an airman, and actually I would tell you this from a joint force perspective, it's gonna be the building of the battlefield networks and a networked approach to warfare that's gonna be the most revolutionary aspect for the next 10 years. Let me skip down the line for a minute, and, and Lynn, so what you just heard the general say you're thinking of, of a societal effect. And I know you and I talked, and you, one of the things that stuck with, with me is you said, um, I asked you if when I'm a grandmother, you know, knock on wood, um, am I not gonna recognize the world that I live in and have to ask my grandchildren what the technology means? So what's gonna change societally that's gonna affect what General Goldfin just said? And is it gonna be the same? Is he gonna control the means? So I, I believe that if you think of the internet in 1990, the comparison today is where we are as, of if, as if we were in 1990 with uh, a lot of convergence of technologies that have been alluded to today. So if you think about computing, we have computing large and small, fast and everywhere. If you think about sensors, we have sensors everywhere in society. They can sense almost anything we want to sense and we have the algorithms that can largely understand what's being sensed. If you think not only of our ability to gather information from the environment, but also the ability to act on the environment through robotics. We have robots that can swim and hop and jump and fly. And uh, again, big and small, they can reconfigure, they can fly in swarms. And so um, we have those robots. We have lots of data that's being generated from all the computation, from all the sensing. And that data is available into, in the cloud. And the AI technologies are allowing the sensors and the robots to make use of that the same way that we're making use of that information. And we've talked a lot about the network today. The network is being uh, enabling all of these uh, technologies to talk to each other. And we have intuitive human interfaces. And so those interfaces are allowing us, as well as our technologies, to access everything in the world. It's going to be interconnected in a way like the internet um, is today. It's going to be these devices and technology that's throughout the world. And so from a positive perspective, as citizens, it can help us in many ways because it enhances us as people. Now we have the ability to know about anything anywhere through the environment and even have the ability to act because we have these intelligent devices that can, like robots, that can act for us at a distance. Even as a, a citizen, I'm not talking about in the war fighting mode, I'm talking about just the common citizen today in the 20 years of the future. And so because of all of these and the ability to interface with these in a very intuitive way, I think that in 20 years we will not recognize a society because of this leap of technology. And it's a confluence of all of these things happening now and available now, and it's happening in the commercial world. All right, Alan, it's happening in the commercial world in a very significant way of what Lynn just described in terms of 
the breadth and the depth of what's happening. And then General Goldfein's describing an effect on warfare. Are those two things going to happen separately? Um, are they going to, you know, how does this look going forward? You're the futurist in the group. How does it look? Right, well, Lynn's just put the commercial dimension brilliantly. Um, I'd like to elaborate it on a bit and then come back to answering the question. Um, we're interested in disruption on this panel. We're interested in innovation. Uh, but almost by definition, these are inherently nonlinear processes. They're unpredictable. Uh, they display emergent properties. They display complexity. They display entanglement. One aspect of the global technium that we observe today is a compression of the time constant, a shrinkage of the time between basic research and application and technologies, increasingly driven in the commercial domain. If you look at the technologies of interest to the department, many of them are being advanced most aggressively by the commercial domain. That is inevitable and inexorable. The challenge, to come back to your question, is for traditional defense industry to say, wonderful, how do I translate the implications of that technium into conventional capability for our military? And I think it's a challenge that we're embracing. All right, Karen, I'm going to ask you this in just a minute. I want to quickly ask Fran. So this spanning of worlds, what's the role of the university in doing that? And how hard is it for you as, as someone who's got a foot in both worlds to bring them together, or is it not hard? I, I think it's when you're a, looking at this future. Yeah, right. I think it's a challenge, and I and I think it's getting better because uh, you look at the amount of money that the DoD or the IC or any of the federal civilian agencies spend on research, and we're noticing that they're starting to gravitate towards building it themselves, towards more of that transitional focus. So. Uh, I, the trick becomes, can you recognize a, a gem and figure out how to transition it? So I think most universities now have a transitional element, whether it starts out, it becomes an FFRDC, a federally funded lab, or it stays as a part of the university. They're going to have some element now that tries to assist in that transition. And you and I talked a couple of other things that affect that are large amounts of non-US citizens in our universities, right? Sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't work uh, when you're in the military and, and less so in the IC. And I, and I think the other thing we're seeing is a large influx of veterans hitting our universities. I know for, for us at ASU, there's three, three to 4,000 veterans in the program right now, different ages, different experiences. And some of them come back from service and say, this happened to me in the service. I'm a computer science person now. I'm just not going to let that happen. I'm, I'm going to work on this. Uh, a lot of times still cleared, sometimes in the reserves. And so I, I think those are the three ways I see that the universities can contribute. First is it offering the transition, having that raw research, but working with the um, and, and capitalizing on this large veteran population that wants to change, maybe couldn't change the military when they were in there, but want to change now that they're out. Karen, I want to hear about your vision of the future. And, and of course, you, you know, what Fran's saying also should resonate with you. Um, so maybe a comment there. But I'm also going to put, put the follow-up question right out there for you so you can link it all, which is um, Secretary Carter loves Silicon Valley. Does Silicon Valley love him back? Um, <laughs> you know, he, we've got the, di, the DIUX. We've got um, the, digital, def, the Defense Digital Service. Um, the Manufacturing Innovation Institute. He's announced a number of new uh, institutions that are aimed at strengthening that link. So what's your vision of the future, and, and do you think that uh, that push, and you know, you're not off the hook on this either, General Goldfein, um, is it working? Is it going to work? Can it culturally work? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question, and what pressure to be answering on behalf of Silicon Valley. Right, and I should, uh, sorry, I should clarify, by the way, that both Karen and Alan do, do not speak for their companies. They're here in a personal capacity, so you can't attribute something they're saying to Facebook or to Northrop Grumman. You can attribute to Karen and to Alan. <laughs> Thanks. Um, the vision that the others have laid out, I, I completely agree with. And I think, um, especially with what Lynn was discussing about the emer emerging world we're all living in, where power is diffuse and where we've got distributed networks, um, I think there's a real uh, risk of the military becoming reactive instead of proactive. And that's why I think Secretary Carter's overtures to Silicon Valley are spot on. Um, I think a lot of people are noticing, and I think um, there's a lot of energy there. 
I do think, uh, from a personal standpoint, there are a couple things that the Defense Department, that other, uh, you know, at the staff level, at the senior leader level, that the, the military can do to harness the, the momentum that Ash Carter has brought, um, I think, so the, one of the first ones is realizing that innovation isn't magic. So I kind of sometimes feel like the department is treating it as such. And I just think it's radical collaboration, especially in centers of innovation like Silicon Valley. It's uh, radical collaboration and stepping outside of your comfort zone. And it's nonlinear, as, as you were saying. What do you mean by radical collaboration? Breaking down stovepipes. Um, shedding, you know, in a way, shedding the uniform, shedding the persona of who you are and stepping into another's shoes um, and collaborating where you haven't before um, because in a world, as Lynn described, we're, we're absolutely going to have to to get things done. Um, I think the other thing is uh, a real translation of the problem you're trying to solve. So I think what we run the risk of from coming from Washington out to a place like Silicon Valley is saying we're looking for new tech and uh, people are kind of like, well, as a means to what? And, or if you say third offset, unfortunately that might fall flat. So a, a better way to approach it might be, um, here's the problem we're trying to solve, because I think the common thread from the military, from the government, from tech, is people who really want to tackle big problems and want to have an impact. That's the common thread among those communities. So um, I think it, rather than going out there with your fully baked strategy, eight by 10 glossy, go out there and whiteboard it out. You know, get in a room, have a draft strategy and white, whiteboard it out, because that's really how things get done and that enhances that radical collaboration. Um, and then the last thing, which, you know, not to get into the acquisition process, because I think everything was said earlier today, but I think approaching things from just getting rid of bad process when you can. I mean, that's what I've noticed uh, in the tech community is there's not a lot of process, and process is a four-letter word. So get rid of it, kill it, break rules where you can, unless it's, you know, illegal. <laughs> okay, so let me lay those two things at your doorstep, which can you? Can, I mean, can you break the process? Do you want to break the process? How much of your innovation dollars are locked up in legacy systems or in soon-to-be legacy systems? How much flexibility does the Air Force really have? And then, uh, you know, secondarily, um, you know, I, I would be interesting to hear you comment, too, on how the Air Force attracts and retains people like Karen Currington. Yeah, well, first of all, it's exciting to have be sitting next to Karen and see your title, Major Air Force Reserves. How cool is that? Um, and I'm actually a little bit hurt that 25 PowerPoint slides doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> one, of my great, one of my favorite stories, actually, uh, our, 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 our leader of Air Force Space Command, John Hyten, was out uh, at a base up in Lewis McCord, which is up in Seattle right next to Silicon Valley. And he's pulling up into a parking lot, and up pulls next to him is a Tesla. And out of the Tesla comes a senior airman in uniform. And so he looks at the airman. He looks at the car, <laughs> looks at the airman, says, OK, diga me, talk to me. What's going on here? In, in case you don't know, an airman's salary would be a bit of a stretch yeah, for a Tesla. Be, <laughs> that's right. And he said, well, sir, he said, uh, I'm, the, uh, I'm, I'm head of security for uh, Google or some one of the major companies out there. And he said, but um, I want to serve. And I want to make a difference, exactly what you said. And so I'm also in the Air Force Reserves. That's what it's all about. The reality of what goes on to a large extent like Silicon Valley, and I'm not an expert, so Karen, you can correct me 100%, but you know, in Facebook, your primary reporting mechanism is to the shareholders. For the United States Air Force, our primary reporting is the American people and the taxpayers through their elected leadership. There, therefore, is a certain amount of oversight that we will always live with that may not be the same in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. So it's different pacing, right? You have a you have a ability to perhaps move faster in Silicon Valley in some areas, right? And we're going to be more methodical here in terms of how we're going to move forward as we continue to report on our process. And so if you have two pacing strategies in two locations, what happens when you hit one plus one? And how do we get to that to equal three? Because we leverage the strengths of the two systems. Mm -hmm. And what we got to do in the Air Force and in the Joint Force is we got to be, we, we got we to be an organization that these young people want to join and be part of. 
we got to create, uh, the, the secretary calls it permeability. You know, we got to bust through some walls and make sure that we make the right thing easier for folks to come in and serve in the Air Force Reserves or come in and work part time, come into the Air Force and serve some period of time and leverage that capability. And we got to be able to make sure that that's going both ways in a two-way street and a dialogue that goes back and forth. So I think where the Secretary's taken this is exactly right. Uh, he, he has acknowledged um, and helped us to understand the war for talent that mm -hmm. we're in. And we need the Department of Defense, and I can certainly speak for the United States Air Force, to say that we need to leverage that talent and that capability that's there to help us as we move forward. At the same time, is looking at the way we do business that provides a lot of times some structure and some repeatability right. as we develop technology that can help Silicon Valley. So I think there's a two-way street here. Yeah, I mean, I'm not wondering if those paths are, are really ultimately reconcilable, but you know, the whiteboarding hoodie, you know, where, where it's a flat organization, if it's compatible. And, and again, are your legacy big acquisition platforms compatible with this sort of um, dispersed and democratized technology. And I know Alan has some thoughts on that. And Lynn, is it true that we're democratizing innovation and, and that we're um, democratizing violence on some level? You talked in very positive terms, but there's a downside too. And is, are we dispersing and democratizing innovation? We are uh, dispersing and democratizing not only innovation, but certainly the access to all these technologies as well. We're making it so that it's, it's very easy to use, and that's a positive thing uh, in the sense that we can have perhaps smarter cities because we can pool resources and have governments and, and individuals who can use information to do things like improve health care or tra improve traffic congestion and that sort of thing. So in that sense, it brings it down to the individual um, and that there's many positive um, outcomes of that, and that's why there's commercial investment in these areas is because there are many uh, commercial applications. But these technologies are very much dual use in the sense that the technology that you develop for one application has military application, but it also uh, can be used by militaries around the world and individuals around the world, individual actors around the world. So it is a, 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 an important challenge to, to grasp with, grapple with. So, I mean, when we talk about, you know, Alan, Fran, when we talk about offsetting, and we usually mean adversaries, are we really talking about offsetting everyone now? I mean, offsetting commercial development and the diffusion of innovation and the fact that it's available to everyone? How do you offset that? I don't believe you do. I think you go out of your way to harness the outcome of that democratized technium or technocracy. But I'll acknowledge it's challenging. I mean, the very nature of the survey question had a somewhat false dichotomy. We had artificial intelligence over here and synthetic biology over here. Why would we view them as distinct? Uh, I can see on the one hand why categorically you would, but from the standpoint of innovation, what happens when artificial intelligence begins to practice synthetic biology? We had George Post up here earlier noting that we now have high school students uh, creating synthetic organisms. They do. There's an annual competition at I MIT called iGEM, uh, founded by Tom Knight. It's in its 11th year. Initially postdocs, now high school students. Um, and uh, if you look at some of the writings of, uh, and, and demonstrations, actually, of Craig Ventner, he articulates the concept of a transporter. Well, actually what he's doing is he's communicating via RF or whatever other means the genetic sequence that he wants to replicate somewhere else on the planet or on a different planet, right? Because when he advanced the idea, it was from Mars to Earth. Why bring your life form from Mars to Earth? Just beam the genetic code back once you've sequenced it in situ, right? So you take that kind of technology, and one of the challenges we have is in the translation of genotype into phenotype and you turn the artificial intelligence loose on the problem, right? So the protein folding problem maybe becomes trivial under the aegis of machine learning. And by way of an example, I'll highlight Watson, which has been mentioned on a number of occasions. Uh, one of the things IBM did really almost as a publicity stunt after the Jeopardy show, which itself was a kind of stunt, was to send uh, Watson to cooking school. And they had Watson survey all of the literature, all of the recipes, all of the writing on, on, on cooking, taste notes, flavor notes, human sensory perception, all of that. 
and then said, okay, watch him go. Create unusual recipes. And of course, watch him combine things in a way that a human chef would never have thought to combine. And some of them turned out quite badly. Uh, some of them were surprisingly good. What was extraordinary was the rate at which Watson could do that. And if you're interested, you can go to Amazon and I'm sure buy the book. There's a Watson Cooks cookbook out there. Right? Now, what happens when we apply that same technology, which is all done in front of games, of Watson to the identification of the appropriate genomes for de novo life forms? Now, so long as we're harnessing them in benefit of industrial application for the good, for the health industry, uh, wonderful. Uh, but as is the point's been made, uh, many of these technologies cut both ways. There is a, a black aspect to this that has to be taken into account. So none of this is requirements based. I'm not aware of any labs, national labs, working on that particular problem. But the forces are in place to make an outcome of that nature, and I emphasize that nature if not in detail, inevitable. That should be of concern. Um, you know, Fran, uh, I mean, what do you think about that? And especially, I mean, how does this affect warfare? So I think for 30 years I've been in defense. I think in the beginning we were technologically superior. There is no question that DARPAs, IARPAs, we were so technically superior that it didn't occur to us that it would, it would level. And, and I think what we're looking at right now is a leveling of the technology playing field that I, I, can, I, I don't want to, but I can build a bomb in my house. I can go look it up. I can do these things. And so it goes to your point with anything that's good can be used for evil. I think it's the speed of transition. And, and I don't mean that acquisition. Look, I'm not, I don't want to reform acquisition. I, I don't know how some of those people working on that take, take that, right? That's a very difficult job. But I think you, got, you have to have people who strategically think, who are willing to look at the big picture and say, I recognize what this is. This is an insider threat. This is an IED. And be able to react and, and take evasive action. And that's not easy to train. And so I, within the university systems, within I'm sure you as well at NSF, the Air Force, trying to train people to think that way is, is fairly difficult. And so that's, that's one of the things we're looking at, that ability to have people strategically think but still line up and, and, and still you know, uh, be able to function as part of a larger organization. So I, I definitely agree that the good and evil thing is, is very scary, I think. I'd like to give the audience a chance to ask questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and uh, make sure you identify yourself and your affiliation and make sure it's a question because I may seem nice, but I will cut you off if you go on and on. <laughs> so please, this gentleman right here. Karen, while we're waiting, just tell me what a day is like at work at Facebook relative to the Air Force. Oh, wow. Um, well, so I've been off active duty now for nine years. But you remember. But I remember. I remember it well. Um, and yes, I, I think if you're coming from the military, you are optimized for hierarchy. It's just in your nature. That's how you're trained. So a transition to Facebook, even though I've worked in a lot of other great places, um, it has been a challenge. And I'm not a digital native. I'm not a millennial. So that's a challenge, too. I'm like one of the oldest people there. <laughs> the CEO is younger than me. <laughs> but um, it's, uh, it is very flat. It is very fast paced. It is uh, very collaborative. And they do move fast and, and break things as part, was part of the values. But they're very much like, hey, let's just move fast. Um, so I think to Fran's point about that being ready for that, that type of thinking, that strategic thinking, what we it come into contact with every day is just ambiguity and complexity. So being ready to think in that way, there is no process that you can rest upon. There's no legislative process. There's no you know, budgeting process. There, there's not necessarily a process that you can fall back on. And where there is, it's pretty, you know, it's a guideline. So it's up to you to create a taxonomy, create the guidelines, create the, and we're constantly doing that from scratch, which, and to respond to, to the users. So it's not just the shareholders, it's the 1.5 billion people as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sir, please. Yes, uh, Paul Joyle, NSI. Um, General, you were talking about all the tremendous technology with our new fighters. I recall to mind that during the Crimea operation, there was an article, suspect source in, in Russia, that said a Fencer aircraft had gone over 
um, con uh, conducted a simulating bombing run over a Aegis cruiser in the Black Sea and had um, detonated an EMP device which rendered the entire um, uh, capabilities of, of, the, um, of the cruiser uh, and it had to uh, return to base in Romania. So what are, uh, and, and you're talking network, network, network. So what happens if there's, let's say, a significant space event where there's a huge EMP burst that starts frying everything out there, or in combat, EMP technology is used to take away the advantages that we have as this very marvelous, high-tech, cutting-edge society and military. Okay. What are we doing in, you know, to protect what we're building? In the old days, we had Tempest and we had a lot of other things, but what are we doing now? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I'm reminded of my combat commander boss, General Jim Mattis, uh, United States Marine Corps, who used to look at all of us as, and I was his air component commander, and of course, I had a counterpart for each of the domains, land component, marine component, soft component. And he would get us together and he said, don't tell me you can't fight without communications. Wrong answer. You come up with backup and backup to your backup and make sure that you have a layered plan. And so we worked that pretty hard to ensure that if in fact, you know, conflict did break out in the Middle East and we had someone that came after the network, that we had a layered plan to be able to continue to operate, albeit perhaps at slightly degraded level until we got the network full back up and running, but when, to, to never place ourselves in a situation where one attack on the network could take us all out. So that's the way we approach it. It's a layered defense. You, you identify the most critical systems that you rely on, the critical in, you know, indications and warnings, the critical satellite capabilities, and you ensure that those are the most protected. And then it layers out from there so that you can still continue to operate, and then while it takes you time to get back up, full up and operating, you never get to the point where you're at a standstill. Retired DOD. This is a question for General Goldfein and Major Currington and any others. Um, my son graduated from the Air Force Academy last year. Uh, he's a physicist, 61D. Um, he's at AFIT now getting his master's in uh, astrophysics. What would you tell him and his colleagues, young second lieutenants, what do they need to be doing now to prepare for future warfare and to optimize their contributions to the Air Force and the military? Yeah, first of all, congratulations to your son. Physics, philosophy. <laughs> 3.8. Four stars. 1.9. <laughs> yeah. yeah. By the time I got my diploma, I think the guest speaker had already left. <laughs> uh, so first of all, I would tell your son that it all starts with character. And so he's on a journey for the remainder of his career, whether it stays in the Air Force or he goes on to, to some other service organization, that we are on a lifelong journey to continue to develop our character. Sometimes we get focused on reputation as we get moving through the ranks, and, and we get a little bit confused with character and reputation, right? Character is who we are every day and what we do when no one's watching. Reputation is what people think of us after they've watched us for some period of time. I will tell your son, focus on the first, the second will take care of itself. It's all about character. You know, we, we as the uniformed military, uh, we all know are among the most trusted organization uh, in the United States government. And there's a reason for that. I'm also reminded that uh, America is in love with, its, with your son, and America is in love with the young enlisted men and women that I'm privileged to work with and lead. America is not in love with this general officer corps. America expects me to be a man of character and lead your son well. And so I would say that's the most important thing I'd tell your son far long before we started talking about mission or technology or anything else, because if he takes care of that, the rest is gonna fall in place. Take him first. Amen. And, he, and also, I mean, so are there any hope for philosophy majors these days? Or if you're not an astrophysicist, <laughs> you're out of luck in the future? 
I mean, I was a political philosophy major. Yeah, there you go. I don't tell people at work that. Well, you just did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, well, to your question, I would agree with the general about absolutely the, the, the fundamentals and the character, and that will serve him well no matter where he goes. Uh, I, this is going to come across as very cynical, but I would also say with, with that background, he should serve and then at some point go start a company. You know, like the world is his oyster. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's kind of what I've seen is think big. Just you know, follow your passions and think big, and if you find a problem and you want to go solve it, especially with his background, and, and don't be afraid to do it while you're still serving in some way. Um, I mean, that's, that is the world that we've enabled um, where you can harness technology and create it for good, but you can also go out and do a lot of that good in the commercial sector too. I mean, Alan, is that the, the kind of person that Northrop's looking for? What kind of person these days are you recruiting? Oh, we're recruiting. Yeah, Absolutely. no, I'm sure. But I mean, especially you as a- People to our website. Yeah. I mean, especially you as a strategist and a futurist, what, what, do, you, what do you need? Creativity, initiative, energy, drive, uh, the ability to collaborate. I mean, as we well know from the ethos in the valley, collaboration is everything. Uh, we believe very strongly in that. Um, no one person has the right answer. Uh, it's remarkable, the creativity that occurs when you get the right three, four, five people in a room and they begin arguing over access to the whiteboard. Uh, more of that would be a beautiful thing. And uh, we hire from uh, all domains, right? Uh, creativity, a good idea, doesn't know a particular academic discipline. Right? Well, I mean, you're both engineers. Does the world belong to engineers now? Is, I mean, is it just? Well, uh, so I, I will put in a plug. I agree with all the comments here. I will put in a plug, though, as a computer scientist uh, for the, the young people out there not to be afraid of, of technology. And it actually, I think it is a national security issue because if you look at our graduate programs, they're majority foreign nationals. And so we need more American-born people to go into the, the high-tech fields because there's a lot of opportunity and there is really a lack of, of, of people going into those fields insufficient. Go ahead. And then I'm, I'm gonna ask one closing question because we're just about out of time. Uh, so. I won't tip you off what it is yet. Amy Nelson, the Council on Foreign Relations, and I was a philosophy major. Wow, we have um, a preponderance, right? So uh, we talked about the inevitable diffusion of, of these new technologies and um, the distribution of innovation and, and knows no boundaries. And presumably we have a responsibility to arm our soldiers on the battlefield with the latest and greatest, most cutting edge technology. But is there ever a responsibility to hold back or to slow the pace of innovation? And secondly, um, uh, presumably we learned a lesson with, with cyber where the technology evolved way before our defenses did. Are we developing countermeasures to these new technologies simultaneously and what does that look like? That's a great question, first, yeah. Uh, maybe I'll jump on the first one. And, uh, so we withhold technology every day in this fight. So in each, uh, in each fighter aircraft that's flying today over Iraq and Syria, there's a button on the control stick. We call it the pickle button, and it's what you actually press when you release munitions. And we like to say there's half an inch from hero to zero, because every munition that's dropped is a strategic weapon. And we're gonna hit everything we aim at based on the technology that's at our disposal for precision-guided weapons. And when you're a young aviator, Every fiber in your being wants to go close with and destroy the enemy. And it is through the discipline and training that we have worked into this young force that allows them to withhold ordinance when it just doesn't seem right. When it just doesn't, you know, you, it just doesn't feel right. Um, there's something that you're seeing in the display that doesn't seem appropriate for what you're trying to do. And so we bring a lot of weapons home. But we've acknowledged the fact that in terms of that technology, the bomb you don't drop sometimes is as important as the one you do. And so I think that's just one small aspect of how we have capable, we have, we have technology at our fingertips today that we withhold because there still is chivalry and discipline in how we apply warfare. That fighter pilot culture is really existential for the Air Force. 
is it a barrier to becoming, to adopting the kinds of innovations that the panel's been talking about? It's so individual that I don't think you can, I don't think we can do a broad brush, you know, because the, I mean, you sort of think about uh, what it takes to be able to strap on a high performance aircraft and, and operate at the speed of sound. You've got to be a um, world class athlete right, to be able to sustain nine times the weight of gravity as you be able to continue to manipulate all the sensors in the aircraft. You've got to be able to think, not only for your own aircraft, because if you're focused on what's going on inside your cockpit, you're way behind. You've got 100 aircraft out there that you're thinking about. You've got to be able to uh, have the right amount of aggressiveness to close with and destroy the enemy, mm -hmm. and, and know that, uh, that um, you'll live with those decisions. And then you've also got to have the discipline to withhold ordinance that we just talked about. All that comes together in order to per create the individual that we need uh, to be able to go and do that business. I'm not so sure that within that, it will, you'd find, I think you would find those in that business that can be very innovative and those that may be not so innovative, but I think it's the full spectrum. We are out of time and uh, it is time for the reception. I just want to ask a last yes or no question, which is war has driven innovation for most of our history, um, and in other things have too, but war has been an important force for innovation. Is innovation going to drive war going forward? Is innovation going to decide the character of war? So, Fran, what do you think? I think yes. Yes. I think clearly yes. Yeah. Yes. Maybe. No. <laughs> Now you can come up and ask him why he thinks maybe afterwards. Thank you all very much. Uh